Horizontal versus vertical force when sprinting is a huge debate, probably the biggest debate out there within the sprinting community. So it is something that I wanted to get more into to really give a bit of a more definitive understanding of what ends up being more important, horizontal for force or vertical force. And at the end of the whole thing, what I, and at least in my opinion, this has been something I've talked about in the past, I do think horizontal force ends up being the big thing that is critical, but it does seem like vertical force from a overall production standpoint ends up being the highest number when you're actually sprinting. So you create a lot more vertical force than horizontal force when you're sprinting. And there can be more of a discrepancy depending on your sprinting style. And so first we'll go into that and being able to really understand more of the differences between the more of a horizontal force sprinter, which would be Usain Bolt in comparison to uh, somebody that would be more of a vertical force sprinter, which is Marcel Jacobs here. So so essentially, it has a lot to do with the backside mechanics. So if you have a longer backside mechanics, you get your foot up higher, uh, more knee bend, things like that, that's going to be a longer backside. For those types of athletes, more horizontal force ends up being the critical thing in comparison to uh, if you have a shorter backside mechanics, shorter leg swing behind, faster really turnover, then the vertical force ends up being more important, right? So faster turnover, shorter leg swing backside, vertical force more important, longer backside mechanics, and, and also longer turnover means more horizontal force, uh, or really being able to create more horizontal force ends up being a better predictor of overall speed. Now, with that being said, when we look at things like the sprint velocity curve, for instance, right? So this is really dealing more from a horizontal force perspective. So when we're looking at the top here, this is going to be when you're accelerating, right? So we start with velocity being zero, I can't I'd put any markers on this, but we start with velocity being zero, which would be that blue line, essentially, and then the red line is going to be the maximum amount of force, but this is going to be a horizontal force. And this is why people make the argument that when you get to max sprinting speed or a better determiner of max sprinting speed is horizontal force is because when you get to your max speed, then horizontal force essentially becomes zero right? Because now you don't have any more force pushing you forward. So if, as you're accelerating, you are creating force horizontally. When you get to what would be your max speed, now you get to the end of your horizontal force production because you're not accelerating anymore. So technically the force is at zero, but in reality, you do still have to create horizontal force to be able to maintain that speed because if you stopped horizontal force creation, then you would end up decelerating and going back to zero. You still have to be moving your body with the same type of mechanics that was creating horizontal force and got you up to that top speed in order to maintain that top speed. But in terms of the actual numerical force velocity, it ends up being zero just because you are maintaining that same level of speed. Now, vertical force is always going to be present because you always have gravity. So you're always having to overcome that vertical force of gravity. You don't have that same type of resistance when you're running. You don't have a backward force when you're running. It's essentially just neutral, but you're going to have always a downward force, which is gravity, which you're trying to overcome. So for the vertical force that you're going to be getting from reacting to gravity and also from airtime, right? Because you're going to be, both feet are going to be off the ground when you're sprinting. That's what really defines sprinting, right? When they go and do like the walking competitions, you have to always have at least a foot on the ground. That's going to be the differentiation between walking and sprinting. So in that airtime, that's going to also be generating that vertical force. Yeah, the more vertical vertical force that we can generate, it, it seems like there's a direct correlation between that vertical force production and also the amount of time that you're able to spend on the ground. So the higher the amount of force that you're generating, then the shorter the amount of time is. So long distance runners are gonna be spending a lot more time on the ground, therefore not gonna be generating as much force into the ground. When you're walking, you're gonna be spending a lot more time on the ground, a lot less ground force into the ground. When you're sprinting, a lot more ground force into the ground, very short time periods into the ground. So in order to really best predict how fast somebody is, 
it has a direct correlation to the amount of force being generated in the ground. And then especially when they get to top speed, it's much more vertical force that's into the ground, right? Because like we said, that horizontal force ends up being zero when you get to your maximum speed. It's gonna be different for everybody. So it's hard to be able to find that because there's people that from a, when you look at their, their force velocity profile, they'll create a lot of force and will not be able to achieve the same numbers of velocity, right? Or, or be able to accelerate as well. And then there's also people that don't generate as much force but then are able to create high levels of velocity. So there doesn't seem to be a direct correlation between what ends up being horizontal force production and overall velocity. But there is a correlation between your ability to generate a lot of force and the amount of time that you end up spending on the ground. Again, there's not a direct correlation either to generating large amounts of vertical force into the ground and then also correlating that to maximal sprint times because there's people that can just only create vertical force in the ground or just only create a lot of force in the ground but are not actually covering very much distance per step right because when we look at speed what we want to be able to see is we want to see contact time we want to see great distance per step and then we also want to see very fast turnover time. So your legs are moving very quickly. And when going deeper, deeper into this, I spent probably two, three days looking at all this stuff, trying to find as much information as I can and, and really making it so this video can be as effective as possible. What ended up being a key determiner as well, it ends up being how fast does your lower leg accelerate? So when we look to see this and we, we get deeper into your ability to really accelerate in that lower part of your leg, right? How fast does that accelerate, right? And how fast does you, do you get your heel up? So when you're landing, how, how well do you absorb here? How well do you get your heel back up? And then essentially your foot back off the ground, right? So this is gonna be a longer foot contact time, right? This is a longer distance. So we can see here with a athlete who is running faster, so this is, you know, 3,000 newtons of force, large amount of force into the ground. He's landing here and he's off the ground here. So he's a little bit past point one in terms of foot contact time, but is able to generate large amounts of force in that very quick period of time. Really another big key determiner here ends up being the mechanical changes that happen within this lower shin. It's called like the two mass model. So it's essentially separating this part of your body with the rest of your body and saying that the amount of acceleration that you have in this lower body is a key determiner when it comes to the overall acceleration of an athlete. So when your foot hits the ground here, if you're able to very quickly absorb that force, maintain a lot of speed within this lower shin, and then therefore transition off the ground very quickly, that is a big indication of very large amounts of forces and and also very high speed capability. So if you want to run higher speeds, this would be something to avoid because he's landing here and he's very slow to then be able to transition off. So he lands a little bit before 0.05 and then isn't off the ground until after 0.15. So he's on the ground for like 0.12, maybe 0.13 seconds and does not generate a large amount of uh, what ends up being vertical ground force, right? But this is, again, this ends up being a study based off of you're not moving, right? This is a study based off of you being on a treadmill, okay? So when it ends up to, coming to actual production of speed and being able to run fast, it's a lot about how much distance are we covering per step. When we can look at the distance per step, then we have to be looking at it as a horizontal movement pattern. So really from a sprinting perspective, and this is why I say that the horizontal force pattern ends up being the critical numbers because essentially when we look to see the fastest people in the world, what they are doing is creating large amounts of horizontal force. So we can see how all of them are pulling their foot back in the ground. Okay, they're creating a large amount of horizontal force, regardless of if they're continuing to accelerate, they're starting to decelerate, they're maintaining the same speed, whatever the case may be, they're moving horizontally. A speed test is a test of horizontal movement. If we talk about the planes, it's how fast can we get to A to B, not 
A to B, right? We're not trying to go up, we're trying to move horizontally. At the end of the day, it does end up being a vertical and horizontal force production. There does seem to be a direct correlation between your ability to accelerate and have great acceleration with being able to generate large amounts of horizontal forces. And then there also does seem to be a direct correlation of vertical force with foot contact time. So your ability to create large, large amounts of vertical force ends up correlating to faster foot contact times. Now, again, that doesn't correlate directly to faster speeds. It really correlates directly to faster foot contact times because that makes it so you can rebound off of the ground more effectively. And that is as you're actually running, right? That's not something that you get when you're just upright or when you're just starting, right? If you're starting the more vertical force, then you're not gonna be able to run as fast. But as you get to your top speeds and higher speeds, the higher the amount of vertical force ends up being a direct correlation to faster foot contact time and a lot of times that does end up meaning that you can sustain higher speeds or achieve higher speeds and so just giving an idea of what ends up being more important so really you know to take away the main thing from this it would be understanding that if you end up having a little bit longer stride especially a longer longer backside you, you get your foot higher things like that you are working more with horizontal forces and want to be able to make sure you're able to do horizontal movements well. Single leg broad jumps, broad jumps, things like that end up being critical and really building up your uh, like soleus muscle, right? Knee bent, calf raises, building your foot strength, things like that end up being critical. Where if you're shorter on the backside, then the vertical force ends up being more important. You know, depth jumps, single leg vertical jumps, vertical jumps, things like that ends up being something or, or really vertical ground force. You really want to be able to understand how to be able to create vertical ground force and really maximize vertical ground force. Because we see both of those. We see both of those in, in training where we'll see a lot of people that end up going really fast here and then back down it's like almost like a super fast turnover and you see people get their their knees through and then they're going right back down knees through right back down so they're almost working just in this kind of box area where and that's not something that I typically teach. What I try to teach is more on the horizontal force production where it's here a little bit longer with the overall leg cycle, right? Or, or longer turnover times, but also end up generating more horizontal force, putting more of a focus on continual acceleration, long-term acceleration. So, you know, that's what ends up being a big difference between vertical force producers when it comes to sprinting is they're quicker to accelerate to their top speed, but they hit their top speed faster and then you know are not able to sustain as well where horizontal force producers are not as fast to getting their top speed but they're able to generate top speeds longer have quote unquote longer speed endurance and so really being able to maximize that ends up being an important part of being able to really run fast i think long term so a lot of information there i hope this answers your question about what ends up being more important horizontal force or vertical force would be happy to answer any questions you guys might have about this I spent a lot of time looking into this. It's kind of surprising how some of the top sprint people in the world were not very specific about this very important concept. And I don't know if it was just, you know, a lack of context. I mean, one of them seemed like they were just saying vertical force ends up being the key, right? Like the holy grail is vertical force, I think is the name of the, the actual uh, blog post. And there's another thing that was, uh, you know, just a, like a video about horizontal and vertical force. And it was mostly just talking about ratio of force um, and didn't really get in depth into either one like didn't take a stance on, on vertical or horizontal I don't know if that means that you know both of them are needed but again just didn't this is why I created this YouTube channel in the first place with, because I went online to be able to figure out like speed and, and how to teach people how to run faster and was just very disappointed in the information right there's just not the, the right quality information to help people get faster. That's why I created this channel. This is why I wanna be able to continue to help you and continue to make videos like this. So hopefully you can better understand how to be able to run faster by you know, being able to understand, are you more vertical force, horizontal force, apply this information, utilize this information, ask me questions, check out the description as well. Like the video, subscribe to the channel. And if you have any questions, comments, recommendations, leave those down below. The description will have everything that you need if you are looking to get trained by somebody that actually understands what ends up being more important for you, the horizontal force or the vertical force based off of how it is that you're sprinting, which is what you need, is somebody that's going to teach you what you need to improve on based off of your mechanics 
mechanics, not somebody who's just going to teach you some generalized, generalized information because of, I don't know, some random book or, or what one person said. We want to be able to be students, not followers. So we want to be able to get as much information from a wide variety of different sources and see different sides and then be able to, based off of that information, make decisions accordingly instead of just being followers and finding one person that ends up being right on some things and saying, therefore, they are right on all things. And so uh, that's really a big thing that I really try to concentrate on, especially within the sprinting community, because I think that it ends up becoming very easy to be closed off from other ideas and other concepts where, you know, I'm always trying to get the other side of the coin. I'm always trying to disrupt the traditional ways of doing things, because I think at the end of the day, we can always get better, we can always improve. And if you're not trying to create any disruptions, then you're just going to be end up falling, succumb to what en ends up being the norms. And I I don't want to be part of the norms. I want to be part of the uh, advance, the people that are taking further steps to continue to get better and seeking more information, new information, the thing that's going to make it so you could always improve. And, and that's really what my program is all about. So again, thanks for watching. Like, subscribe.